Sometimes the job is not so much balancing an orchestra, which in the past it was. What you get is a sequence, MIDI data, and you somehow have to translate that. I encounter a lot of skilled people today. I mean, there are definitely orchestrators that are, that are artists out there. I think the idea of an orchestrator, um, you know, emerged in Hollywood, uh, also in Broadway, uh, as a time-saving device and just a labor because you're on a tight deadline. Um, that's how it started. Um, I think as pop musicians started to score movies um, orchestrally, especially, I think an orchestrator became a required part of uh, somebody that can translate uh, a pop or folk language into an orchestral context. Um, so it's really situational. It depends on the composer. It depends on uh, how well trained he is or how what his background is, um, whether he comes from a synth uh, programming background. N now it's different. I think um, mostly, I think through the through the eighties and nineties, you could get composers that were new that didn't come from a classical background that were orchestrating or or composing. Um, you know, orchestral music. Danny Elfman's a great example. Um, you know, he came from a pop background and incredible artist, had this incredible voice, um, but he didn't come, you know, I think he'd orchestrated a couple big band things for uh, the band they had before, uh, Oingo Boingo. And um, at this point, he's a great orchestrator, right? Because he's got all this, this piece learned the language. And, um, you know, it, it's something that's learnable. Um, now I think, you know, there's a lot of competence out there. I think um, even so many people are trained coming out of schools with, with uh, lots of orchestral skills, um, looking at, and Danny Elfman also kind of like, I think, cracked the door for um, everybody to kind of go, hey, maybe I could do that too. Um, and it, it's become more of a viable career path where people are trained in it. And um, yeah, I, I, I encounter a lot of skilled people today. Um, but on the bigger movies, you're running into these deadlines. You're running into sometimes you have six weeks, sometimes you have eight weeks, sometimes you have a year um, on certain projects. I think television maybe one of them, video games, same thing. Um, and you can orchestrate yourself. Um, but if you're running on a six-week or eight-week deadline and you have to write 70, 90 minutes of music, um, there's very little chance, I think, you're going to be able to translate um, your music into something that's playable on the first or second take. Um, you know, even even if you're even if you're highly trained, now a lot of it things are composed in MIDI, so they're composed in a sequence. And as an orchestrator, what you get is a sequence MIDI data, and you somehow have to translate that onto into Finale or another scoring program. Um, and there are a number of ways to do it. I know someone like Tim Davies likes to actually clean up the MIDI files and then port the MIDI files into Finale. Um, someone like, um, um, you know, there are other, there are other orchestrators that like to enter it all by hand. So you open up each and every kind of like middle, litty, um, little MIDI file, um, sequence or track, and then enter it by hand. Or you open the global session, uh, a section, an orchestral section. You open up a woodwind section, or you open up a brass section, kind of look what's going on, and then you start assigning voices and translating it. Um, you know, maybe it's a low brass patch, and you have to decide, you know, how am I going to split this up? On Guardians of the Galaxy, we had a massive brass section. I think we had two tubas. We had um, 
I think we had six or seven trombones um, that doubled on Chimbasso too. So it was really interesting. And it was some of the language was new to me, like how to use, how are you balancing, how do you use that? How do you deploy that? Um, and there were a lot of low effects with tubas and like minor seconds way down here um, that were more effecty and going for impact as opposed to um, balance or music. And um, it, it's, it's, it was a really interesting, cool process because I learned stuff and um, it was also interesting looking at the ways composers approached it. Like what I'd get would be different. And um, you can kind of start to ferret out, um, you know, the styles um, of, of certain people. Um, it was, it was a neat, it was a cool process. Um, a lot of the stuff's recorded striped, what they call striped these days, which means they will, um, record different sections separately. They'll record the brass section, then they'll record the percussion section, uh, the woodwind section, string section completely separately. Um, the idea being that the dubbing stage engineer has a lot of options. If they want to pull stuff out so it's not fighting against dialogue or they want to push um, woodwinds because they weren't necessarily balanced in the room, um, they can do that. Um, so it's kind of interesting to hear nowadays you can get I don't know how to put this, but it, it's not, sometimes the job is not so much balancing an orchestra, which in the past it was, because you want the orchestra to sound gorgeous in a room, right? You want them to play together, you want them to balance, you don't want the woodwinds to get lost below the, the, the strings of the brass. Um, it's kind of a non-issue on some of these dates because um, they're all being recorded separately. You can always push the flutes if they're too low, um, if you want more flutes. And um, it, it's, it, that aspect of it, I think, is different than it, than it has been in the past. Um, the guys I look up to are guys like Bruce Broughton, um, John Williams, of course, Jerry Goldsmith. Um, I, had, um, I had the opportunity the, um, to, to, to sit and listen to Bruce Broughton talk about orchestration for a couple hours one time. And it was wonderful. That guy's just a fount of knowledge. Um, his wife, Belinda, is um, the concert master on a lot of dates in town. Um, she played on the, I think, in the, in the London Philharmonic when they did the first Star Wars record. So she's got this storied past, too. Wonderful people. Bruce Broughton um, talked about how to train your dragon. And he, he loved the score. Thought it was the best score of the year. His, his caveat was like when they played the suite, when they took the music as orchestrated and had a live orchestra play it in a, um, in a concert situation, it didn't balance, right? And even, even, um, even the composer, um, uh, John Powell, was like, eh, it, didn't, it didn't quite sound right. And be, it's because it was orchestrated for a scoring session that was going to be striped. It, was, it wasn't necessarily meant to balance in the room. Um, and there are ways to, you know, it's how you approach it. It's how, what the end product is going to be. How is it going to be recorded? Um, what, uh, what's requested? What are the deliverables? Those sorts of things. And that all goes into to how you approach an orchestration. Um, on Guardians of the Galaxy, the mandate was don't blow up the orchestration. You kind of like orchestrate, translate it, but you're not adding anything. You're not, um, you know, adding glue with woodwinds in the background. You're not doing these things that I think if you were going to approach it like a traditional orchestrator or if you're going to um, approach it like a, like a concert suite that was going to be played live, um, those are the things you'd probably think about. Right? You think about how can I add glue here? How can I um, make it so it sounds like an orchestra as opposed to a, um, you know, something that's a little more disparate when it's just played together in a room? I think orchestrating is, is it's pretty technical. 
I think um, there are tricks you learn over time. There are, it, it, it's, it's very craft based to, the way I think about it. Um, composing, I think, um, you know, the ideal is to develop a voice, have an individual voice um, and have that be recognized on, on some level. Um, so I kind of separate the two. Um, although, I mean, there are definitely orchestrators that are, that are artists out there. If anybody talks about Alexander Courage or Herb Spencer, who's, um, who was John Williams guy who did everything from the late sixties up through the mid eighties. So E.T., Jaws, Star Wars, those were all Herb Spencer's orchestrations and it's nothing that John Williams couldn't do, but his approach to it, I think, was different. And I think um, when John Williams was coming up, he would look at Herb Spencer as somebody to emulate and someone he learned a lot from and someone who did have almost a voice as an orchestrator. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, the line is gray. But um, yeah, I, I think you can definitely transcend the, the craft and orchestration and become an, become an artist. They're, they're, you have... Um, you know, orchestrators in town who who look up to these guys, guys that are working on the top films, guys that are doing the biggest movies in the world, citing these these individual orchestrators as kind of their inspiration, um, and going, well, that guy, that guy's, you know, I don't even know what he's doing, you know, um, and these are from these people that are that are amazing, people like John Cull, who I have immense immense respect for. As a composer, you should work the way you'd, you'd like to work. I think orchestrators are used to getting what they get and making music out of it. Um, and it varies drastically what you get um, from project to project, from composer to composer, um, as far as articulations versus patches. As a composer, personally, I prefer... It, it depends on the instrument. So um, with your flutes, for example, I, I, I love having the patches. I love the, the performance legato. Um, and I think sometimes I'll just hit a short note uh, so I don't have to go into the staccato patch and actually have that. And I think the orchestrator, you know, they're detail-oriented people, so they're going to pick that up. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think composers should think less about what the orchestrator um, needs. Uh, you know, cleanliness aside and accuracy aside and, you know, clearness aside, clarity aside, um, I think orchestrators are used to, to, to seeing MIDI data in all forms. It depends on the budget. So uh, it depends on the time. It depends on a lot of things. So um, the last movie, the la this film didn't have any live instruments. It was all MIDI. The film I did before that, a couple months before that, we recorded maybe 15 minutes of music live. And I, because it was such a tight deadline, I hired uh, my friend Drew, who also orchestrated on uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, to, um, to help me out. And it's nothing that I couldn't do, but I trust him. He's great and he's fast and I know it's going to be good. Um, and it saves me time. So, um, and then I, if I need to, I'll go back and just look at it and then make a couple tweaks if I want them. Um, and then, and then go from there. So it just, it depends, I think, um, budget and time. Um, I used Sibelius forever when I, when I, um, worked on the family guy with Ron Jones, um, just because I found it incredibly easy. Um, I learned it literally in two nights. Um, before a session, like when I was first starting, I just kind of learned it. It was that easy to pick up. Um, I've been using Finale lately because um, working with with Tim Williams, I uh, that's what he uses. That's what's kind of expected. So um, on the projects I did with Tim Williams, I used Finale. So I got I got to learn that, and I had to learn it fairly quickly. And um, yeah, I think I think I like finale because there's I and granted I haven't I haven't used Sibelius in probably five years. Um 
But finale, there's something about the detail of it. Once you, it's a hard program to learn. I think it's hard to learn how to do some things. Um, but once you learn how to do them, and once you integrate something like Quick Keys or um, Keyboard Maestro, one of those third-party programs that actually have shortcut keys, um, it becomes a pretty powerful tool. And I'm not saying I'm not dissing on Sibelius. I'm not saying anything bad about them. I think they're a great company too. And I'd be curious to go back and kind of see where they are now because I haven't I haven't used it for a while. I think the rule and and there's actually union limits. I think in Los Angeles, and I think it's I don't really know. I think I thought it was like five minutes an hour or something like that. But I think that that's for a big feature film score. Um, that's not just whole notes. Um, I think five minutes is a good average. I think it's what people shoot for. Um, I think you can do, I've done 10 minutes. Um, a pretty complicated, not like, again, the musicians weren't sweating. Um, but it was orchestral, you know, it had notes. Um, I think, I don't know, pushing it over that, I think you're, you're just going to get it's just a little ridiculous. People are going to feel pressured and, and, you know. And I think if it's really complicated stuff, I mean, we, on one of the Family Guy episodes, they were trying to duplicate a track from the 50s from this musical called, um, oh man, what was the musical? It was about a girl boxer. And she was knocking guys out. And it was, it was something that just the recording existed, so we had to transcribe it. We had to orchestrate it, and then we had to, um, and then we had to record it. And we spent maybe an hour recording this f- three-minute piece of music because it was, um, you know, song form. And you know, Seth came back and was like, "No, no, 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 all wrong." And he was, I think, he was hearing the performance as opposed to the actual what the arrangement was or what the orchestration was. And we spent another you know, we spent maybe another hour and a half on this three-minute piece of music, and I don't think we ever got it right. I don't, I don't think we ever got it to the point where Seth was like, that's it. And I don't even know if the episode aired. I don't know if that piece of music aired. And it was really, it was a massive, you know, 90-piece orchestra. And, um, you know, and I think he was responding to the way the musicians played back then. And this is a bit of a digression, but you know, they, pl- they swung. It, it was a swinging piece, and people swung differently back in the 50s, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And then post, um, you know, post 70s, you know, and everybody, sax players I know either sound like Coltrane or they sound like, um, y- y- you know, they, they come from these lineages, right? And those lineages weren't established back then, and it was kind of, they were coming out of the 40s. So the swing was a little stiffer, it was a little straighter, and it, it just, the band never could quite sound like a 50s band. It was really interesting. 